A concert and a protest tonight against masks and limits on indoor church services, led by an evangelical Christian singer with many followers. But his critics claim what he's really doing is creating super spreader events. Well, Jeff, the show started uh, just about an hour ago, but people really started showing up early in the afternoon. We estimate it to be uh, several thousand people. You can see they are packed in front of that stage. They are mostly maskless. We spoke to people who came from Arizona and from up north who took planes to get here, a fact that will only raise concerns from people who think this event should not be happening. super spreader concert. People showed up to try and stop a Christian singer from performing on the street. Singing and sermons can spread the virus through the air. As a result, you have a lot of particles spreading. The CDC calling that event a super spreader, finding that just one asymptomatic person infected 52 others. Thousands standing shoulder to shoulder with almost no one wearing masks. Said the event endangered the lives of her residents. It's a super spreader event. Oh my god, are you kidding? This is part of the North Complex, which has burned more than 250,000 acres and is only 38% contained. Fire officials say it's moving so fast, it's burning at a rate of 1,000 acres per half hour. California's on fire, figuratively, literally. I mean, this state is a mess. The people that got us into the mess that we're in are not going to be the ones to get us out. Growing up as a kid, I had a post-it note in my bedroom with a list of the most unreached, persecuted, difficult places in the world to worship in. And having now been to almost all of those, including North Korea, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, and worshiping in those, I never imagined that in 2020, the most difficult place to worship in would be America. March 3rd, 2020, Super Tuesday. We were in the Bay Area at our campaign office. We were gonna celebrate our victory that night. Later into that night, the results kept coming in and I kept falling farther and farther behind. And then at one point it was like, there's no way we can come back. I had done everything they said you're supposed to do, burn the candle at both ends, traveling America and across California, raising support. And then I'm looking at my family I'm angry that I put them through all this. I'm angry at myself. I'm angry at God. Like, what are you doing? I drove four hours back home, didn't say a word. Me and my wife didn't talk at all. I just was seething with rage and anger and hurt. The only word that I got from the Lord in that season was that I felt like this wasn't the end of the story. I knew this wasn't the end of the story. Almost like a week or two later, the pandemic hit. The first case of the deadly Chinese coronavirus making its way to the U.S. But you can already see the impact here in Times Square, eerily empty, and now the possibility of even more painful restrictions. The San Francisco Bay Area already taking similar drastic steps to slow the pandemic, completing another night under its shelter-in-place order. Shops locked up, normally bustling streets now oddly quiet. Nearly 7 million people told to stay home for at least three weeks. California was uh, 
by far the most restricted state. It's a stand-up paddle pursuit. A paddle boarder is chased down by law enforcement for being out on the water at Malibu Beach. The incident caught on camera as the paddle boarder was taken into custody. If you've observed recurring violations of the safer at home order, please continue to let us know. You know the old expression about snitches. Well, in this case, snitches get rewards. As the weeks began to, you know, 21 days to slow the spread, became six months, became whatever, what really struck me was the entity that they were the most harsh on was churches. And they kept blaming churches for spreading the virus. Hundreds of infections linked to church services. More than 650 coronavirus cases have been linked to nearly 40 churches and religious events across the country. And then on July, it was like July 7th or 8th, the governor of California came out with a new set of restrictions. With all due respect, it's essential that we practice physical distancing everywhere, period, full stop. And so I would highly encourage anyone that is not practicing physical distancing to reconsider it. And to the extent they refuse, uh, we will apply social pressure. Uh, and to the extent possible, we will advance additional enforcement. One of those restrictions was you can no longer sing in church anymore. We also put out new guidelines for places of worship. And I remember when he said that, and I heard that, I was like, <laughs> okay, it's on. Silencing worship, silencing the church, silencing our voices, the thing that gives us hope, the things that, as I've been saying, pulls heaven down, the thing that fills our communities with joy in the midst of such pain. Like you can't, you can't mandate, not only constitutionally it's not right, but like as a believer, you know, like this is our strength. I was pacing up and down my house and my wife looked at me and she was like, oh gosh, she could just see that look in my eye. She was like, why do you look like that? And I'm just like, this is not right. We got to take a stand because I was blown away at how many leaders were complying. Like people were like, oh, okay, sure. You know, we won't sing. I'm like, what? That's all you do in church. And that's the day when I decided it's time to make a public display. So I threw up a post on Instagram. I said, meet us at the Golden Gate Bridge. Let's worship. California is one of 25 states where houses of worship have taken legal actions over restrictions on gatherings. Lawyers collectively say it's a sign that America's bedrock principle of religious freedom is being severely tested by the pandemic. I feel like when Sean was running for Congress, we saw behind the curtain of a lot of evil and control and far beyond what we were aware of. That's why it wasn't hard for Sean to take a stand. He was like, no, he knew fully like what he was standing up against. I'd never fully hit a point where I had to decide what I believed. I've never had to choose a side. And suddenly I work for a man who's very much chosen a side. Sean texted me, he said, I want you to invite as many people you know to the bridge. And just urgently, I was texting every friend I knew. I'm like, skip, skip classes, come to the bridge. Here we are, it's gonna be fun. We have a group starting here at the north end, and we're gonna be walking south. We have a group from the south that's gonna be walking north. We're gonna meet in the middle. The San Francisco Police Department pulled up. A guy came up on a motorcycle. He said, I wanna know what you guys are doing. And I said, well, hey, we actually came to the bridge today because we want to pray for the city. And he was like, looked at me and you could see like tears starting to well up in his eyes. And he's like, man, we've been waiting for you guys to come. Immediately he got his radio and like 20 police cars showed up. Then as we started talking to him more before we started, he was saying that, that the bridge was like the number one destination for suicide in America. And that so many people had committed suicide. There had been so much trauma on that bridge. As we started to worship and pray, it's like you exit the current reality and circumstances that surround you and you begin to just like speak from heaven. We started declaring the Western Gate is open in America. We believed our whole life, right? That when we pray, when we declare, when we sing, that things change, right? Yeah. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for a new generation rising up and seeking your face. We declare a spiritual gold rush 
to begin in California. We say open up the gates, open up the gates, open up the gates, that the king of glory may come in. But we had no idea that that momentum would carry. A night full of worship brought more than 1,000 people from churches on the Central Coast together Friday. I heard that he was an anti-masker, basically a Trump supporter. And he, he does these worship services, but he does them as First Amendment events. Newsom's practical guidance to keep all Californians safe elicited a kind of narcissistic injury to few and clearly of many, many other almost exclusively white Christians. Sean represents a certain kind of sensibility, a kind of unbridled confidence for the proponents of this. There's people that are gonna say, we're choosing faith over fear and God's bigger than coronavirus. I know that like God has his hand over this whole thing, so I don't think there's a worry. There's greater good in being here than there is being afraid of a virus. I think many of the policies around mask mandates, they are driven by a desire to try to love our most vulnerable neighbors, to protect people. A very loud night on Skid Row, homeless activists yelling for this woman to wear a mask. She refused and even tossed one aside that was handed to her. We made it clear, if they want to come to this community with masks on, we're okay. And those performing did have masks on, but the crowd still didn't welcome them. But you can't come to our community with your colonizer religion, acting like you own the place and putting people in jeopardy. You're going to come in to pray with people and take the chance of giving them that plague while you pray with them? Really? It didn't go as comfortably as they as as they wanted it to. To me, it was a photo op. Come into Skid Row and use the people in Skid Row as a way to raise money or say, hey, uh, look what we're doing. Things are actually shifting in the atmosphere. Even if we can't see it with our fleshly eyes, things are shifting. F your white Jesus. I think he's dangerous because I think he really believes what he's doing. I am very concerned about this, the super spreader of, um, of, of the coronavirus, especially when it's being done under the Big Tent revival. It's been an incredible, uh, very life-giving movement that we're seeing happen across the nation. Churches can be one of the places where COVID-19 can spread much more quickly. So you, you have these two things you're trying to weigh. Do you feel any sense of conflict at all? You know, I think it, I, I have so many friends that are pastors across California and they are doing such a great job and working their hardest to try to follow these protocols and try to follow the ordinances. But I think when things come down uh, from the government that say that you cannot sing, I think you just reach a point where it's pretty crazy. There was a gathering on Decatur Street this Saturday that was not permitted, not allowed, not authorized, not coordinated at all by the city of New Orleans. The Bible says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. I'm sick and tired of these preachers saying God told me. That's why you're willing to put people's lives in danger, because your theology is off. You can't get around the idea that these guys are just rock stars posing as Jesus lovers. They make a lot of money doing what they're doing. This guy is making tons of money. He's rising his own fame and star off the backs of, of this political movement. According to my research, the majority of myths and disinformation being spread about the pandemic comes from Facebook articles, which is why we're seeing a lot of overlap between anti-maskers and Christians. It's more complicated than simply thinking that one group of us is right and the other group of us is wrong, especially as it concerns how to respond to a pandemic, the likes of which none of us who are alive right now have ever had to wrestle with how to deal with that. So we had only ever known being liked and we would talk to our friends about our differing political views and they were great with that. They'd love to sit down and have a conversation. Sean's very great at that. He can have a conversation with you, but then, and completely have a different view than you politically, but then 
be bros after. It was never a big deal. During the run for Congress, I had that like solid community that I felt, okay, well, we have this, so it's fine. It doesn't matter what strangers think. It doesn't matter what random lady in Idaho thinks. Like, all that matters is what we have. And then when we took the stand with Let Us Worship, all of that started to crumble. Wickedness, deceit, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all of these evil things that when you put them together collectively, they produce war and social tension. Jesus said, these things come from inside the man. Now that is where communism and Christianity have a headlong clash. Because Karl Marx looked at the problems of the world and he said something's wrong. And Karl Marx said that the problem of the world is social. He said, you solve the social problems of the world and man will be a happy individual. And we can build a utopia on earth. We can build a heaven on earth. But Jesus said, you're wrong. He said, the problem of the world is not social. The social problems are only symptoms of a deeper problem. I, I wrote a biography of a great, great man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor who got involved in the plot to kill Hitler. So when I was writing the book, I kind of noticed creepy, eerie parallels with things I've seen happening in the United States. And this was a real surprise to me. It just kind of struck me. Could something like what happened in Germany ever happen in America? And as the years have passed, my answer to the question unfortunately has become absolutely yes. Bonhoeffer really tells that story because Bonhoeffer shows that if you don't speak up when you see something wrong, if you kind of let it go, you say, well, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to lose my job or I don't want to anger this one or that. And you just keep letting it ride. It gets harder and harder to speak the truth. The cancel culture is a classic example of that. When somebody says, you can't say that. If you say that, you could lose your job. You, get, you think, when did that happen? Like, I can't make a mistake. I can't say something stupid. Government always tends to want to amass power, right? I mean, our founders knew that. That's one of the reasons they gave us the government we have where power is divided. So government naturally wants to gather power. And I think what we're seeing right now is you, you see people that say, hey, we think we know best. We think we know best. And we think, by the way, that Christians are kind of a threat to society. I think a lot of people in our government, unfortunately, think that. And you saw that during COVID. It's like, yeah, there's a reason that they you know, say casinos could be open, the church is closed. Why? Because they kind of think, well, Christians are they're a problem. You know, they're dangerous. Like. Let, let's 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 you know shut down their worship, but it's okay for other places. They're not essential, you know. And so, I think you have that that spirit of control, that desire to amass power, and you've got then real distrust and dislike for Christians and for believers. And you put those things together, and you kind of get to where we are now. Powerful people are going to want to keep that power, and they're going to want to exploit opportunities to either stay in power or gain more of it. And so, yeah, absolutely, it would be naive to think that folks were not doing that. You know, there's this thing that we have across the nation called toll bridges. And when toll bridges started so many years ago, the whole promotion was the toll was to help us to pay for the bridge. But once the bridge is paid for, the toll never stopped because you become accustomed to certain things. And while I don't know that it's government's intent, that's the problem that we have in government, is as they gain control of making decisions of our life, rarely are they given back to the people. And that's where we have to have people that will stand up and say, wait a minute, we're drawing a line in the sand and we say, no more. We have to protect our liberties, have to protect our freedom. Even if I make foolish decisions from my liberties and my freedoms, it's the consequences that teach me to not make foolish decisions. World War II is taking place, it ends in 45. Kim Il-sung, who's the grandfather of Kim Jong-un, who's the current president right now of North Korea. He arrested all the Christians, all the pastors. So my dad was arrested. Thankfully, under General MacArthur, he had a brilliant plan, strategy to invade North Korea, push the North Koreans back. And when he did that, all the prisoners got released. So my dad got released, along with millions of North Koreans who migrated to the South. You talk about getting emotional, because I wouldn't be here if it was for the U.S. soldiers to rescue my dad, uh, a lot of the North Koreans who moved to the South. And as a result of that, my dad understood communism, and he hated communism. 
I get a letter from the city prosecutor in Pasadena, now from Sacramento, saying that you're violating the health code, CDC requirement, and uh, governor's orders. We will arrest you. We'll put you in jail for one year. We will fine your church members $1,000 per person ever since you've been meeting, which is May 31st. We're talking about millions. Then the last paragraph is what shocked me. We reserve the right to arrest your church members. And I'm thinking to myself, these are law-abiding, tax-paying citizens who just want to worship Jesus. And they want to arrest them, and they're letting prisoners out because of COVID crowdedness. Because Newsom was letting rapists out, criminals out, drug pushers out. And, um, and yet they want to arrest us. We have come to what Isaiah 5:20 says, woe to those who call evil good, good evil, darkness, light, light, darkness. So we're the bad guys because we're meeting during COVID. We're learning more about the state's plan to release inmates from jails and prisons across California in an effort to stop the spread of COVID-19. Our victims are freaked out. They are completely terrified and feel completely powerless. That's because his killer, Tara Bia Williams, is no longer serving her 84 years to life term. Just days ago, she was paroled in San Jose as one of the thousands released to slow the spread of the coronavirus. So it was at that time, I just called my attorney and said, we're just going to open up. We weren't thinking about soon. We're just going to open up. We're not going to shut down the second time. But then he came back and he said, you know what? This is discrimination. He commends the protesters, but he's locking you down. We have a case to, to sue him for discrimination. So after we had hit a bunch of cities in California, we kept getting these requests. What about Reading? What about Reading? Don't forget where you live. We planned Reading, and Kate told me, actually, before we planned it, she's like, don't do this in Reading. Like, it's, it's sometimes drama. In these other cities, we don't want to feel that at home. I was still kind of struggling with making people upset, and it was a very controversial thing that we were doing, just gathering people in the middle of a pandemic. And I was just grappling with people, and I was trying to really learn how to tune into the voice of God. We planned this whole thing out. We thought that we jumped through all the hoops. We picked this location under a bridge, and we had like over 2,000 people show up. another Jesus people movement coming. The next day, it, everything hit the fan, man. It was like uh, the local news station did a hit piece on us that CNN picked up that went on their front page, like California worship leader hosts a, you know, anti-lockdown event or whatever they say, you know. We didn't realize until we hit our home base that even in our home base, people are divided. And then it pulled my home church into all this controversy and were you behind him and did you sponsor it? And it was like, put them in an awkward place, put us in an awkward place. And we had gotten a text message from people that we love and respect leaders in our life and telling us that they're very disappointed in us. And it, it was like, it's, it broke me. I mean, just having people that you like love and respect saying words like, you disappoint me. It's like, it's just painful, you know, and confusing. It can, it can really confuse you. And you so easily want to divert to being like, okay, let's make people happy. Let's make people that I love happy. Let's make every, let's just make people happy. We were driving from Reading to LA for a, a lettuce worship and I cried from, <laughs> from Reading until LA, which is a nine hour drive. I didn't stop crying and I don't cry very often. Sean texts me on the way, he's like, man, I've just had a rough night. So we do LA on a street corner and all of a sudden him and Kate pull up. And I'm all fired up, ready to do this. And Sean gets out the car, all discouraged looking. I look at Kate and I'm like, hey, Kate. And she's just staring at the steering wheel. She won't even look at me. She's like, hey. I'm like, man, something's going wrong. You know, I could tell that he was in this place where he was wondering, like, what should I do, man? You know, I've got certain leaders even trying to pull me back. My wife is discouraged. She doesn't want me to do this. We already have resistance out here. We have resistance by people we love. My one safe space and anchor is my own wife. 
And for her to also be against me in that moment, as intense as she was, that was really difficult. I begged him to stop. I was like, don't do this. You've, you're ruining our life. I mean, I full on became the troll of his life <laughs> on that drive because it just made sense to me, like, just stop this and we'll make everybody happy. And when he was, he just was like, no, I can't. I, I know that this is what God is calling us to. And that just really caused me to go, okay, God, what are you saying? And it's almost like I was telling her, we don't have a choice. Like we're on the roller coaster right now, we're buckled in. I deep down inside knew that what we were doing were, is what we were supposed to be doing. I just wanted to go away. I wanted the pain to go away. I wanted controversy to go away. I wanted everyone to like us again and um, understand us. I think it's one of the worst feelings as a human being to feel misunderstood. And we were just completely being misunderstood at this point. Shortly after that, we had the, you know, the devastating death of George Floyd that led to even more unrest and more violence. <laughs> So we know there are people who are seeking to divide us, seeking to change the images from being about George Floyd. When's the last time we saw a picture of him? Now it's all about looting, burning, uh, folks that want to change this conversation from the march to justice to the disarray around America. Minneapolis is a city I've loved for years. We've done a lot of ministry there. My wife was born in Minnesota. So we were planning to do a, a kind of a unity gathering of prayer and worship. Really, just because I believe that that is where we find common ground. As we were planning to, to do that, all these trolls came out of the woodworks and real credible threats against the safety of the event. So we canceled that, and I was fully like planning to just not come to Minneapolis, and then I get a call from this crazy Kenyan pastor. His name is Charles Karuku. Charles was like a godsend to us. Charles is like the most joyful, funny, lighthearted bringer of hope that came right at the time of all of this racial unrest. And he calls me up and he says, you gotta come down here. I'm like, where? He's like, we're in downtown Minneapolis on that street corner that everybody across America has seen. So when we arrived at the corner of George Floyd Memorial, we found raw emotions. People were rioting, screaming, chanting. It was chaos everywhere. And the language was so divisive. So we saw that as a very incredible moment to proclaim a kind of a different message unity, healing, racial reconciliation. It felt like a breath of fresh air. Hey, everybody, God is moving. Yes, he is. Yeah. And he was like, you got to come down here. And I said, man, I don't, this is amazing. I don't know if you want me to come down here. Just these, these trolls and this controversy, and I don't know if it's right. He's like, no, nah, we'll sneak you in. And then he came under the radar and we hosted him. We are here in Minneapolis. We declare that there is a shift in the prison. And we say that tonight, that the nation would know the Twin Cities as a place of humility, unity, repentance, reconciliation. We are on the front side of a historical moment. Books will be written about what
what's happening. We saw literally the riot turn to a revival. I know from many first-hand accounts that while Sean bragged online about the success of his event at George Floyd's memorial, that the community itself wanted him to go away. You can make an emotional plea through music. You can get someone to cry and say they want Jesus in 10 minutes or less, but reality is not that neat. And when you leave, that person is still in need. His message is that people like him are being persecuted because they're not allowed to hold church services, but that Black Lives Matter was able to protest protest the murders of American citizens, and that that itself is an injustice against Sean and his people. Explain to me how the church is being silenced, because you can't go to their building and tithe in their tithing pots? How is a church being silenced? Every church has gone online. You can access every message, every song, and these stupid, dumbass dances they do on the stage right now. You can access all of that on YouTube, and, and, and you can have it at your will. You can replay it a million times. You can enjoy the same thing. You can have it. This is not silencing the church. That is a lie, and you're saying it as a Jesus follower, like Jesus wants you to do that. You're telling people that Jesus wants you to go out into a super spreader event without a mask, singing and dancing and sweating and putting out particles of COVID everywhere, and you're saying Jesus wants you to do that. Essentially, he was there to wash black folks white in Christ. There's a lot that can be said about the audacity it takes to think such an occasion is an appropriate moment to do something like that. At the very least, it's tone deaf. It speaks to an incredibly biting awareness of history or a complete lack of attention to how the history of American Christianity has unfolded. According to Religion and Politics, Foyt organized concerts in 52 cities, purposely targeting places where protests for racial injustice have been held, which is exactly why so many of us are leaving evangelicalism in droves. And to show just one example of Sean's utter disregard for what real injustice looks like, he reposted this for real on his Instagram. Quote, if we can gather to honor the life of a drug addict, hashtag George Floyd, we can gather for Jesus. Let me play devil's advocate. When you allow BLM protests and all this stuff to go on and don't say anything about it, then you start up a movement like this. So there's partly to be blamed for the media and everybody else allowing these other protesters to do whatever the hell they please and saying that well, that's good, that's for social justice. And so it's hypocritical on both sides. There was a conference and I was leading worship at this conference. The last night of the conference, there was this passing of the baton moment. An older generation of incredible leaders were passing on the baton to the next generation. It was kind of a symbolic moment. And at the end of that moment, they began to pray and begin to prophesy and begin to declare some things over each individual young leader. All of these leaders were getting these amazing words. You know, you're gonna be an evangelist to the nation. You're gonna be an apostolic, da 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 da. And I was so encouraged, I was the last one in the line. And then I got this word and it literally shut the whole room up. I got this word, I see blood on your hands. You're a man of war. You're created for a season of war. You're gonna be misunderstood. People won't get it. And I'm just sitting there going, what the heck? Like, <laughs> How did I draw this short straw here? Like, I get, these guys get amazing words and then it comes to me and I get this like horrific word. And I actually resented that word. It went on for a long time, very descriptive. Fast forward to 2020, we're in the heat of this uh, congressional battle. You know, I'm running for Congress here in California and I just am like getting more feisty. And my wife turns to me in our room, she goes, I think this is the man of war word. Like, I think that's the season. And I looked at her and I was like, and then this was after we had like lost a lot of our friends. People had kind of like, you know, become like isolated a little bit. Then a few months later, when the Let Us Worship journey kicks off, and then it even becomes more polarized, if that's even possible, then it really started to hit home. Like, wow, this is the man of war season the thing that I hated and never long, never looked for, never longed for, never hoped for is now here. What do I do with this now? Chicago was a mess. The mayor of Chicago sent out a contingency of like 40 police officers under the command of the deputy chief of police to stop Let Us Worship in Chicago. 
They wouldn't even let us unload our sound equipment. We're taking our equipment because we're worshiping Jesus in America. And the police had vans and they're just waiting to arrest worshipers. <laughs> they told us if we set up, if we set up right now that they're gonna take all of our gear and they're gonna bring us into prison. <laughs> we went face to face, toe to toe with them and we lovingly told them about our first amendment. This is a free country. This is not another country out there where some of us run away from. We ran away from dictatorship. That's right. We ran away from socialism. These police officers should be in other parts of the city, not stopping Christians from freely worshiping. Sean said, let's go acoustic. We played drums and acoustic guitars and used our voices to sing. That expression of people of God wanting to continue, but in a peaceful way, it actually touched the deputy chief of police, and she gave us her bullhorn that we can use it to speak to the, to the people. We love the police of the And we say, let the fire of your love begin to ravage this city like never before. Let the fire of your love begin to melt the hardness and the coldness that is in this city. This is our 26th city. You've gotten a lot of negative feedback, uh, not just from non-believers, but believers as well. And the Rolling Stone actually wrote an article about you calling it Jesus Christ super spreader. What do you have to say to people who think you're not being wise with, you know, hosting these large events during a pandemic? Well, I feel like the Rolling Stone article is pretty prophetic. You know, at the time I was like, what? But <laughs> I actually really prophetic Jesus Christ super spreader. I mean, that's what we're all called to be. <laughs> So we just released 36 cities in 15 states for Let Us Worship in the next three months, and we need your help. Tell everybody to come. These are going to be life-changing gatherings. Revival in America this summer. Let's go. What's up, guys? We made it to Montana. We made it to Idaho. We're here in Atlanta. The prodigal has come home. Finally. <laughs> We are in Seattle, Philly, California for Jesus. We're doing this. I'm standing on the National Mall holding in my hands our public gathering permit. Let's do this. Everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. That's why I'm out here in the woods right now, walking in the rain. That night in South Chicago, we did a Jesus march with over a thousand people through the worst crime infested part of the city. And it was powerful to see that many people marching through the dark, singing and shouting the name of Jesus over their city.
New York City at the time was ground zero for COVID. To another grim milestone, the world surpassing one million deaths from the coronavirus. So it was like the worst COVID rates in America, really in the world at the time. I wanted to go to my favorite place in New York City, which is Washington Square Park. It's iconic, you know? It is like, it's in all the movies, it has the fountain. It's just like, when you think of New York, like that's what I think of. So we went in and we had a worship service. It was really rogue. It was right under the archway. You know, we set up two speakers, got a band. We worship. God, that as the worship goes up, walls of division would come down. We thank you, Lord, that there is another story that the media isn't telling. It is one of hope. What really marked me that day was when we started baptizing people. They were giving their life to Jesus. They were getting rid of their suicide medication, their heaviness, and they wanted to get baptized, and we had nowhere to baptize them. And so I looked behind us, and there was the fountain. As we went over to the fountain, I realized the, you know, the the water and it was only like this high. So we had to like put them down and like splash water on their face, you know, and bring them up. As they get into the fountain, Lord, and the water covers them, God, I pray they would step out of that fountain a new person. It was so iconic, man. It like started a whole baptism movement everywhere we went. More than half of American adults say their mental health has suffered because of the pandemic. Prescriptions for antidepressants shot up 14% after the initial outbreak. It's only going to get worse. You don't think the worst is over? No, not at all. No, I think in a way the worst is yet to come in terms of mental health. The significance of the impact on our mental health. And there's a new study that's now suggesting that impact is huge. New study published in The Lancet looking at the global impact of this virus on mental health found the incidence of major depressive disorder increased by 27%. So I had two boys, Johnny and Justin. Johnny was a Marine. Uh, he served in the Marine Corps, did two tours in Iraq and Justin was going to college. Johnny went to the Marine Corps when he was 18, did two tours in Iraq, and um, he came home and he was diagnosed with severe post-traumatic stress. And the answer that the VA gave him was psychotropic drugs. And they actually gave him uh, drugs, Klonopin, that caused his suicide. Johnny took his life here at home in his bedroom. His younger brother found him that night. He was already cold. And then I lost Justin a year and a half later. Justin took his life. It was about five months after I lost him that I became very angry. I was drinking a lot. I was taking Ambien and, and vodka just to try and sleep to not deal with the pain. But still, off and on, I would have thoughts of suicide. I had just gotten through a really bad breakup where it was kind of abusive and just really toxic. And I felt extremely alone. 
Um, and of course it was uh, during COVID, so I was isolated. Every thought I had, every thought I had was, I wanted to end it. And I spent a lot of that time like in my car, just very isolated in my, in my room, isolated. I almost felt out of control. Like every thought that I had was going towards death. That's scary. I even dealt with a little bit of self-harm through these points, which I had never dealt with before. I got very close to taking my own life. It was so much came on me and then I'm like, why are you even trying, Janine? Just off yourself, you know, nobody really cares about you. You know how the, 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 the lies that, that you either tell yourself or, or the devil is whispering in your ear, you know, that you're worthless, nobody loves you, blah, blah, blah. I had made the decision after January 6th not to watch any more stuff, okay? I would only listen to praise and worship. And then I got a recommended video and it was Let Us Worship. That was when going to the Sean Foy thing happened and completely transformed me. I just believe right now, and I know that a lot of depression is a chemical imbalance at a cellular level, but guess what? Jesus paid the price. I knew you were going through stuff, but then being like, well, no, like this is, this is really heavy. This is really serious. As soon as he started praying and everything, you could begin to see like slowly this weight lift off of you, it was so visible. Like even when you were crying and you, you know, you dropped to the ground and you could see like the heaviness just fall off you. When you began to come back up, you came back up smiling, you came back up joyful, you came back up free, right? You were running around, you were smiling, you were joyful. And I had never seen you like that before. I don't know what it was, but I'm standing here alone in front of my TV with my three dogs praising and worshiping and the tears are just coming down and I'm like I started to repent and I said God I said I'm sorry I I put my faith in man when God moves like that and you feel it for the first time for real you, there's no way that you can't rejoice like that there's no way that you can't let it out let that joy out let that freedom fill the room from suicide to salvation to joy to real joy one thing that you could say about revival i think is that even if you're not particularly religious yourself you can see people especially young people finding purpose usually with genuine revival people find peace with god peace with themselves uh and it gives them kind of a quiet joy, which, I mean, I think that's the whole point. And it also touches everything in the culture and good things can come out of it. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say that America was born out of revival. The foundation of America is that God is king. The foundation for England is the king is God. And so when you begin to think about it, there was everything in the American spirit that pushed away from the king was God over their lives. And so you see that freedom is, is at the very heart of what the gospel is all about. How many of you guys know that there's only one way that America can be saved? And it's through the name of Jesus. This nation was founded on Christian Godly principles and America can never exist without Christianity. And I feel tonight like we are standing around the table of brotherhood, black, white, and brown. But there's something the Lord began to show me about this table of brotherhood. I saw the one presiding the table is none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. We are going to see reformation, and I believe this is what Sean is going after. Not just revival and repentance, he wants to see the systems of this nation shift. And I believe that what is gonna take place over the next four or five hours, I believe in my spirit with expectation that we are gonna see a shift over this nation. We believe in the church. There's a pandemic, there's a plague, 
here's a move of God that's going to change America. Prophets have been prophesying that there would be a new wave of glory tonight. I came to tell you, America, you are the wave of glory. Come on. Those who look at this moment 100 years from now, they're going to see the fruit of the impact that has lasted generations and the shift that happened in America would be more visible. Could it be we are asking for too little when God is saying you can have it all? Come on, you can have the justice. You can have the peace. You can have the freedom. We can have it, but it can only come from Jesus. Every city in America will be saved. If God's the one that started this, who's going to be the one to stop it? I remember right before we went to Portland, Sean was on the phone with the police chief of Portland. And they were saying, hey, I'm asking you very nicely, please don't go. Please cancel your event. He said, Sean, we can't even control our own city right now. He told me, we have a gang of 13-year-olds that are going around stabbing people, and we, don't even, we can't even find out who they are. And he was just like, I know you have a right to do this, but I'm asking that you don't do it right now. And he's like, OK, no, we're still going to do it. And I'm like, all right, here we go. I think for three months straight, people had just seen the city burning. The night before we got there, they were burning stacks of Bibles in the streets. They were riding next to the courthouse. The feds had come into the city, and the feds couldn't even stop the amount of crime. I wanted to pick Waterfront Park. It's right there in the downtown part of the city. It's a block from the courthouse. I don't want to be in the suburbs. I don't want to be somewhere safe. I want to be right in the middle of where this is happening, because I want to see God do something powerful. And I remember I went on a run, and I feel this weight, man, like this spiritual oppression, like haunting me, like you're gonna be responsible when people die, and you're gonna be responsible, and it's your fault. But yet I could feel something inside of me, like I know this is what we're called to do, like we gotta do it, like we gotta take a stand for the sake of America, for the sake of this city. I got about 10 emails from other Christians that were like, and pastors and leaders, how dare you call people to go down there and worship in that dark place, you know? I'm like, I thought that's what we're called to do. I couldn't find a band. I couldn't find sound guys. I couldn't find anybody that would go with us. And then I met a group of on fire Russians. And they were like, we heard you want to do worship here. This is amazing. We're with you, brother. We'll bring our sound system. We'll bring our cameras. We'll bring our, you know, our, we'll bring bodyguards. You know, they were like willing to roll. And I remember talking to them on the phone. I'm like, why do you, you guys don't even know me. Like, why do you want to help me? They're like, because we are determined to not let the city that we live in become like the place we fled. I didn't expect that level of like demonic activity. <laughs> They threw a flash bomb into a group of kids oh, that were out there really uh, from I'm like four months old to like ten. And they actually threw tear gas bombs at, at, at a whole family, a lady carrying a baby. The baby started choking, they were freaking out. <laughs> Walked up to ask them to stop throwing things at the children because there's kids down there. I mean, they're toddlers. Yeah. And they sprayed me too, obviously. That was the first time that I'd ever had people rioting us. Like, they were yelling and screaming at us. And, like, a whole mob of people would come in and just go through the crowd and be screaming with megaphones and threatening to be violent. And I didn't know as a mom at that point, like, okay, what, what do we do right now? I had some bodyguards, thankfully big Russian guys, you know, that were amazing. And they they escorted me and my family to our car um, after that night, and we, we actually left. We, like, we didn't even stay in the city. They were throwing these spiked metal things in the road to pop people's tires. They had concrete, huge chunks of concrete that they were chucking up people as they were leaving the worship room.
You know, the whole thing is fear, man. It's fear. It's intimidation. This is not political. This is biblical, man. We have a call for revival in this season. Another one that, that wildly impacted me was going to Seattle, to the chop zone. Whew. We had, gosh, Antifa and all, all kinds of people. Sean brought his family to Seattle. And they're in the back of the park next to these Antifa guys that have their drums and their full body suits. My wife had a whole group of Antifa guys surrounding her. One of them had like knives in his back. I mean, it was like a real crazy thing. And there were all these Antifa guys looking over and screaming. And I'm thinking, I don't think I can watch my husband be murdered. It was terrifying for the entire time being like, what is going to happen right now? These people are out of their minds. There was so much hate. It's wild, first of all, that this is happening in America. And it's wild, first of all, that people are OK with it. Seattle was the only let us worship or any event that I've ever left because of fe like fearing our safety. And it revealed to me, you know, not only the opposition in the flesh, but the powers and principalities that hate the fact that we are worshiping in that place. There was these guys that came in and they're coming to knock over the drums and I think they poured liquid on the keyboard. Hey y'all, what's the emergency? What's the emergency? I'm just curious, what are you carrying? What do you, what's the emergency? Hey guys, if you're going to the praise and worship event, hey sir, what does what she care, sir, what does she carry? And they're running in and I I remember looking over and in this, this moment where you could see chaos and people running, I look over and you see the church on their knees. God, we pray that you would get a hold of their hearts. God, that there would be such reconciliation with you, Lord, that they would hear your heart beat, that they would know your desire for racial reconciliation, God. There was a, a man that we met that he literally, he grew up in the communist country and he stood up for the gospel and he got placed in a concentration camp. This man has lived through it and he is taking what's happening in America very seriously. Joseph Bondarenko, he was titled KGB's Most Wanted. He came and met me in Santa Barbara. Коммунисты очень стали насаждать патриотическую идею. Communism is a very dangerous path that any country could ever take because it's evil. It's a slippery slope that leads to more destruction that we can ever imagine. He grabbed my hands, you know, and he said, Americans don't understand. He's like, all the things that are happening right now is how it began for us in Russia. Don't meet together here, don't do this. Only a certain amount of people can go here. And they started to ease with small restrictions. It didn't start in our country, it did not start with big explosion of everything. Yes, a lot of things happen, but things were happening gradually. At that time, Christians were considered as viruses of society. Viruses that infect people's minds, and specifically younger people's minds, with idea of existence of God, which was contrary to the government agenda. Government demanded worship of themselves. He says, then they came in and he's like, America needs to wake up. You have to wake them up. You know, and he was holding my hands, speaking in Russian, being interpreted by his son, like crying. And, you know, I'll never forget that moment. It really did mark me. I think God picked Donald Trump, an imperfect vessel, to be the champion of his people. I think what Donald Trump did 
was not change America, but reveal America. I think that that happened for evangelicalism also. It didn't change evangelicalism, but Donald Trump sort of revealed it. It's not that, that people, most Christians thought Trump was the Messiah. It's that they wanted the Messiah to look more like Trump than Jesus. How close is Christian nationalism to white nationalism? It is close in many ways because Christian nationalism holds up this mythical understanding of America as God's chosen nation and it really does whitewash uh, the troubled history of racism in uh, America. So it's not a huge step in many cases from ardent Christian nationalists to uh, white nationalism. I'm convinced that one of the greatest threats to Christianity is this nationalism that's trying to camouflage itself as Christianity. The Bible doesn't say God so loved America. It says God so loved the world. We, for Christians, our primary identity is not in America, it's in Christ. This is the lie of nationalism, that our people matter more than someone else. There's no other nation in this world and God said, that's my nation. There's no such thing as a Christian nation. Think about it. Jesus didn't come to build nations, he came to build a kingdom. We often kind of replace Jesus with America and um, that becomes sort of our theology. There's this sort of exceptionalism that, that America becomes kind of the new Israel. America replaces Jesus as the messianic hope for the world. People get very upset that, you know, we think that America is the light upon the hill. But if the light goes out in America, the light goes out on the earth. I'm not saying we are the light. Arise and shine, your light has come. That scripture was not about America. That scripture is about Christ. But if America's light goes out, it goes out around the globe. Who picks up that torch? One, two, three, four. I think there's a huge sentiment right now that it's really hip and cool to hate America. You will gain a following if you speak ill of our country. You know, if we look, they're tearing statues down. They're literally trying to erase history. And I'm not a historian, but show me another nation, another land, another country on the planet that was founded on the principles we were. And so it's hard to understand why there's such hatred. We're not gonna make America great again. It was never that great. It's like virtuous to be ungrateful for where you lived and where you grew up. Now, most people haven't, haven't experienced what I have. They haven't been to 70 countries around the world. They haven't seen that there truly is no place like America. And it doesn't mean we don't have faults. And I think it's interesting because Somehow it's controversial to love God and yet love the nation that he put you in. I think it's American privilege. I think that Americans have no idea what they have. People are often very, very malleable to cultural pressure. I think the spirit of fear um, is being spread at an alarming rate, a rate that people are just being taught to, um, that fear is kind of a virtue, that like you care more if you fear about something. But the Bible says that perfect love cast out all fear. Love is more powerful than fear, but right now fear is more powerful than love. Oftentimes governments and church leaders are governed by fear and fear masquerades as wisdom. And, uh, and we really have got to pray and learn to recognize the difference because one is disastrous, it leads into further bondage and the other one uh, takes us into a place of freedom. My family, they're all doctors and nurses so I knew when the virus happened that it was real. I knew, but I knew that the fear that was coming along with it and the opportunity for people to seize on that fear, specifically politicians and leaders, I knew that that was gonna be a bigger problem. Not to take us down a historical detour, but you can look back to, to what the kings did in England and they always said, well, in the name of public safety, I'm gonna suspend your right to speak. I'm gonna suspend your right to, to press. I'm gonna suspend your right to, you know, they didn't have religious liberty. And our found, founders were like, no, 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 uh-uh, no, we're gonna enshrine those rights and so government can't take them away even when there is 
an emergency. So I think what we've seen in the last year and a half is, again, you, you've kind of seen some, some people who really love power, and they've, they've said, oh, well, in the name of safety, I'm going to do all kinds of stuff. And you know what? That's just, that's not our country. And, and I'm just like, we never are supposed to have a theology that allows us to let the government tell us when and how to worship God. I mean, it's very strange. Like, we don't wait to the government to give us the okay. We're the church, man. We got 2,000 years of worship history. The Church of Jesus Christ. We've worshiped through persecution. We've worshiped through pandemic. We've worshiped through unrest. It's what we do. And when things get crazier, we worship more. <laughs> right? And I, this is not an anti-government thing. Our battle isn't against flesh and blood. It's against powers and principalities. And in 2020, the principalities wanted the church to shut up and sit in a corner and watch the live stream. And if you love your neighbor, don't get together and worship because then you really don't love your neighbor. Meanwhile, suicide rates are exploding. Drug and alcohol use is ravaging America, rioting and, and destruction and unrest, and there's no church to bring the hope. A new report tonight shows in stark detail how the COVID pandemic has made America's drug crisis far worse. Overdose deaths soared 29% last year to a record high. This new spike in suicides was first reported at the start of the pandemic. The sharpest increase was 15 suicides within 14 days. September 18th, uh, 2020, Sean Foyt was coming to town to do a Let Us Worship event. And we'd known Sean for a long time. I said, hey, we're in town. He goes, man, get your wife. Put a song list together. Get a band. Let's do this thing together. And I, I began to realize that September 18th, the date that it was happening, uh, was my brother's birthday. I went to prayer, and I was like, God, what, what's up with this? And I felt like he said, uh, it's time to plunder hell on your brother's behalf. And I got up on stage and I said, hey, this is the land of Buccaneers, the land of the pirates. You know, I said, there's a godly version of that thing. And I said, when, when Jesus died, he went down into hell and he plundered hell and he took back the keys of death in Hades so that those could have life. And, and I began to share the story of my brother and how my brother was from Tampa and it was his birthday and how he had committed suicide because he was bound in darkness. And I just said, man, we're gonna plunder hell today. And I said, I'm not going to lose any more brothers and sisters. I don't want to do that, you know. And I just made this call, and I said, you know, if there's anybody out there that's struggling with suicide or depression, I said, uh, I don't want to lose you. Come down here. I want to hug you. I want to love you. I want you to feel the love of God. Don't know. Don't know how valuable your life is. God paid the ultimate price for you. I just began to weep, and, and man, all these other men came forward, and they were weeping, and we just hugged and embraced and did something that you're not supposed to do in the pandemic. You're supposed to social distance. You're supposed to stay apart, you know, not touch each other. And I'm like, hell with that, man. We need to touch. We need each other. Come on. Let's pray life over them. I am sick and tired of the spirit of death taking out this generation. We speak over you. Life, 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 life.
believe that Jesus not only is the answer and not only is hope and truth, but he's also healing and he's also power. And he's also, you know, I, the way I like to call him, I say, Lord, I thank you that you are forward progress. So when it comes to being a non-believer in American, they're looking at the world right now saying, what's gonna happen? When everybody says the world's going to hell and there's no hope and we're too divided, I'm telling you, I've been to 110 cities. We're not nearly as divided as they say we are. Here's what I wanna say to you today. It can feel like we're under siege. It can feel like we should be hiding, like we should be quiet, like we should be curled up and, and, and in a ball. And what I think the Lord is saying to us is, rise up, mighty men and women of valor. Rise up for this time. Rise up, the Lord is on the move. I believe in the, in the depths of my soul. If we don't stand up right now with courageous faith and leadership, we will lose this country. We haven't developed our muscles of resistance. We think, if I play patty cake and I play nice, uh, they'll leave me alone. We don't understand. There is a time, if you have discernment, now's the time to fight. Bonhoeffer was trying to say to the Germans, they thought, oh, this will all blow over, da, 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 da. you're too much of a hothead. You have to have that discernment. Now is the time to tell the powers that be, this is America, don't you dare ever tell me what I can and cannot do or say. There is a revolution afoot. There are things happening today in our society that are pushing people to a second American revolution. And I'm not talking about one with guns. I'm talking about one that is about change, about bringing us back to foundational principles and truths that we might continue to see the favor, the blessings of God that we received from the very beginning because we were a people that love God. transformation by mirroring the culture around you. You bring influence by illustrating the liberty that is in Christ, the absolute love for people. It seems like both sides spend more time talking past one another than trying to wrestle with the singular kind of central question of who is it that we have been and who is it that we want to be moving forward? You can't really teach it as principles. You have to see it modeled. Jesus! Jesus! And oftentimes, the best way to judge something, to allow it to play out. back down to do the first Let Us Worship in LA, I texted Che and I said, are you cool with us doing this? It's kind of rowdy, it's kind of wild. And he's like, well, actually, it's interesting because I just filed a lawsuit against the governor of California for shutting the church down. <laughs> and you know what? They won in the Supreme Court! The United States Supreme Court last night ruled 6-3 to three to block Governor Newsom's ban on indoor services. California Governor Gavin Newsom ordered to pay $1.3 million to the Harvest Rock Church of Pasadena. No one's above the Constitution. That is the law of the land, right? And so we didn't violate the Constitution. We were obeying the Constitution. Was Newsom who violated? the verge of the greatest revival in the history of the church. You are born for such a time as this. Let us worship God in the fullness of all of his glory. In Jesus' name we pray. It's time for the army of God to come together. Are you with me? We're here to worship. Let us worship. Come on, shout it! 